Shana Haba be Yerushalayim Next year in Jerusalem Over there, over there in the Welcome to Theology in Perspective, the Bible teaching ministry of Dr. Daniel Woodhead. Welcome back. I'm Dr. Daniel Woodhead. I'm your host for Theology in Perspective. It's a blessing to have you with us again. We've been studying for a number of weeks now the subject of demonology. We concluded that two weeks ago and we started a new study succeeding that that I've called the Battle for Your Mind. Now God's Bible focuses in on the New Testament besides salvation is protecting us letting us know that God wants to keep us safe and the battleground for the demonic forces is your mind. You know many people have no peace of mind, they worry, they fret, they're concerned about everything, they're constantly receiving bad ideas, they don't know how to deal with them, and I'd just like to talk to you for a few moments about a subject that we have introduced here, the battle for your mind. But it's the description that the Apostle Paul gives us in Ephesians chapter 6. It's referred to as the full armor of God. You know, it's important to see why God named the helmet of the head which is salvation. I mean, it's a covering of the mind, a covering of the mind. And when we're resting in the safety of our salvation, we can have the Holy Spirit's protection, and we can make the proper response to Satan's attacks. In other words, you can't touch me. Book of James tells us that if we resist the devil, he will flee from us. When we are saved, meaning we believe the gospel. Jesus died. He rose from the dead three days later. That's the gospel, the good news. And now we will be filled with the Spirit. We have a Spirit baptism on that day of salvation. And then there's a, a, a periodic filling, not another baptism as some groups teach, but a Spirit filling. And that spirit filling is what helps us understand and know God more acutely. We know better. And we can fight back the demons by saying, No, I won't think like that or let those ugly, polluted thoughts into my mind. Now this is not some heretical teaching like the power of positive thinking. This is having God's spirit foremost in your mind, giving him a lot of space and letting him teach you and guide you. Now I want to talk to you about uh, spirit filling. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians 5.18 tells us to not be drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So the fundamental principle that the Apostle is trying to convey to us is that we have to allow the Spirit to control our thoughts and therefore our lives. Now the comparison that he makes is that of an alcoholic who's under the complete control of alcohol, drunk with alcohol. The alcohol will control them. It's a mind-controlling substance when it's taken in excess. Now, Christ revealed one characteristic of the Holy Spirit when he said in John 13, how be it, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. So, to introduce this subject this week, as I just touched on it near the end of the week last week, when we properly relate to the Spirit, Satan can't have any influence on our minds. Satan will attack us at our weakest moments and issues. The Holy Spirit will protect us at all times so that Satan will not be successful. First thing I want to talk to you about is knowing God's Word. This is another principle that is of the utmost importance. We have to learn and know the Bible well. When we know the 
whole counsel of God, not just a few verses here and there taken out of context. Our brains function similar to a computer. In fact, computers were designed with our mind as the basis of the engineering design of a central processing unit of a computer. One factor of computer technology is the ability to process information regardless of its quality. And our minds will do the same thing. If we bring garbage into it, it will put garbage out. But the effect is on our soul while it is residing in our mind and being possessed by it or processed by it, should I say. We may bring information into our minds and it'll be stored away for future use unbeknownst to us. You know, you may not even be conscious of the hidden data, but it's going to surface at a later time reminding us of what we took in. If it is good, we can use it for proper purposes because it's going to come back to our conscious mind. If it's bad, it's going to harm us when it resurfaces. And it's probably been infecting us through its influence on our thoughts while it's been hidden. This is one of the reasons <coughs> to prevent evil from entering. The only way to do that is to first be fortified with a complete knowledge of God's word. And secondly, to avoid the pollution that Satan wants to instill within us. It'll make us pure. Psalm one time not, not, excuse me, Psalm one nineteen nine tells us this sort of in the form of a question and answer. It says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. Now consider what the apostles telling us in Romans twelve two. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. <coughs> Excuse me. We must constantly feed on the Word of God through memorization, Bible study, fellowship with other believers that are growing in the Word of God, and listening to messages from the Bible, about the Bible, in clear teaching of the Bible. Satan wants to take us away from serious Bible study and from other believers that are growing daily in the Word. This is not an emotional, centered, mindless, experience-based faith. It's logical and it's practical and it's rational related to an understanding of what God has for us. When experience is elevated above the rational doctrine expressed in the infallible Word of God, we're setting ourselves up for any wind of false doctrine, false teaching that will come our way. Satan is always going to try and deceive. Always. God's Word is the sword of the Spirit that will send Satan and his demons away from us. If we rely on the subjective imprecise emotionalism that accompanies experience, we're ignoring logic and objective truth or the subjective. Now, I'm going to put a chart up that you can look at and you can see that what resides in our mind affects our souls. And a mind steeped in God's Word is pure. Now, what I've done is in the circle in the middle, the white circle, I've shown the soul, and then the outer ring that's brown is the mind, and then you've got this black ring finally on the outside that I've uh, indicated as the world and Satan attempting to influence us. But if we put God's Word as the influencer of our mind, that's what feeds into your soul. Now, another concept that we have to really seriously consider, and I would ask you, have you done this? If you're a believer, have you completely surrendered to Christ? Because we must be completely sold out to Him and then put what He says into practice. Because if you don't believe this stuff, never going to work. Never going to work. You know, I may 
um, have medicine for you, and I'm not a medical doctor, but uh, I may have medicine for you, for example, and I say, well, um, if you take that medicine, you're going to be cured. And let's say you have some sort of a disease, and uh, you say, well, okay, uh, I want to be cured, but you never take the medicine. You're never going to be cured. You're never going to be cured. Or maybe you want to have a, a body like Arnold Schwarzenegger, and you really want to train, and you really want to get muscular, but you don't do the work. You're never going to get there. It's the same thing with us. Sometimes it's just easy to listen and read the Bible, but not put it into practice. See, James 1, verse 22 says, Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, because then you're deceiving your own selves. James says we're deceiving ourselves if we don't follow God's word. You know, you may think that you are, but examine your life. Ask your spouse or your good friends, do I live God's word or not? If not, then start adhering to what it says and be ye doers. Otherwise, Satan has a grip on you and, and he's not going to let it go until you decide to let Christ completely control you. When we are completely sold out to God's word, Anything that comes into our minds is going to be tested against its purity and accepted or rejected on the basis of what Christ says. Not on vain philosophies and worldly practices. Obedience to God's word is essential to positive emotional feelings and positive family relationships. When we are outside of God's will because we're not completely surrendered to him, it's going to have an effect on our well-being and on our families. It's of primary importance for the spiritual leader of the family, the man, to adhere to the principles because that's what the leaders of the family are designed to do. Their attitudes will radiate to others in the family unit and cause others to follow their attitudes. Oh, you get some resistance, but they know what's right. They are steeped in God's word because they hear it from you and they see you living it. Now, whether the man likes it or not, God has made him the spiritual leader of the family. It's called headship. And it was bestowed upon Adam, the first person. When the man exercises godly headship, he demonstrates appropriate godly patterns of obedience and his family will respond in a positive way. And I want to talk to you about having the mind of Christ. This is so important. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 14 to 16 say, But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. <clears throat> But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. You know, when the Holy Spirit came and started the church on the first day of Pentecost, there he was given the mind of Christ to show to the apostles who in turn were to share directly with the early church by their actions, through their writings, and all of this became our New Testament. The Apostle Paul says that the spiritual believers have the mind of Christ. You know, this, doesn't, this does not mean that we can understand every thought that Jesus had. In fact, Paul said that we would only understand part of the mind of Christ until we were on the other side with him. Now, John 15, 15 says, though these are the Lord's words now, he says, henceforth I call you not servants, for the servants knoweth not what the Lord do, but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Now the Lord Jesus shared with his apostles all the things he heard the Father give him. Therefore his human mind was intertwined with the mind of God. This is the mind of Christ. 
and the mind of Christ is in the Holy Spirit and in God, the Trinity. And the Spirit moves through us and back to heaven to God and back to us. Now, look what Jesus promised the apostles, John 16. He said, however, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear <clears throat> that he speaks, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. That means that he's going to move, the Spirit's going to move through Jesus' mind and back to us. So what this means is for the Christian, we have to have a different perspective than the world does or the invent, the, 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 just the things that we encounter, the events that we encounter. <clears throat> Jesus had a divine outlook. One who has become born again is on the path of unlearning the ways of the world and learning the viewpoint of God on the various issues that we experience in life. Now, one prime example of this was expressed earlier in Philippians 2.5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That verse introduced the, a Christ who voluntarily held an attitude that uh, brought itself in humility and harmony. The next subject here relative to the battle for your mind is having a mind that is harmonious. You know, Satan can easily create disunity and dissension and discord amongst Christians that are living according to the flesh. If you're living outside of God's will, there's going to be a lot of discord. Paul clearly identified this in 1 Corinthians 3 where he said, For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and you just walk as men? In other words, he said, In the flesh we will have contention with each other, but with the mind of Christ we're led to harmony and unity. This is being of one spirit and one truth. It's not agreeing to disagree on different interpretation of scripture. Paul was very clear that the harmony among believers must be a unity in the spirit of truth. So our minds have got to be fixed on the same goals and understanding of scripture. Some think that they need to test every instance of doctrine that gets introduced in the church in an open and vocal manner. Others choose a challenging manner to examine these same concepts compared to the revealed truth of the Bible. What neither group understands is that both of these approaches divide and do not unify the church around truth. In fact, because the dissenters don't understand the whole counsel of God, of God the whole counsel of God, they sow seeds of discord because of their ignorance. You know, if we challenge them in the same way, we exacerbate the situation instead of improving it. By examining the characteristics of the early church, we can see they were unified in one accord. Look at Acts 1-4, 2-46, 4-24, 5-12. Paul exhorted the Christians to unify in the first chapter of First Corinthians. Look what he says in verse 10. He says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. The unity expressed here just says you have to have the same mind, which is that of Christ. You don't, you don't need to know every side of a biblical issue. Only God's side. If we all know God's mind on this issue as expressed in the scriptures, we'll be in unity. 
Agreement might not come at first because the enemy is attempting to divide us, but through prayer and a serious study of God's Word, we will come to understand the will of God on every issue. We have the example of the very first worldwide church council before whom Paul brought the issue of Gentiles entering the church without becoming Jews first. There were some Pharisees, we call them the Judaizers, and um, they were in uh, Galatia, which was a region, if you will, of uh, modern-day Turkey, but Asia Minor at the time. They thought that it was necessary for the members of the church council, uh, or excuse me, for the members of the church uh, that were coming in to become Jews first. And Paul did not think this was right, so he came to the first uh, he came back to Jerusalem, he met with James, the bishop of the Church of Jerusalem, and they convened the first worldwide church council. And we see the results of this in Acts 15, verses 4 to 18. It's a substantive part of, of Scripture, but the result was the Spirit of God brought them to one, occur, uh, one accord, if you will, one accord, one together thinking. The problem is the enemy's going to try and keep us divided by causing us not to come together to pray, study, and share in order to seek the mind of God. Pastors and elders must be of one mind. It's understandable that members of the local congregation might be at different levels of growth in Christ and therefore not always unified. Family members might fall into the situation too. Then we must appeal to Scripture to settle the misunderstandings of what God expects of us. We're not speaking of majority rule here, just the rule of one person. The Lord Jesus has expressed in his word. You may say, well, you don't know my church, you know. We've got divisions in doctrine. We've got divisions here. We, This guy wants a parking lot. That one doesn't. This one wants to change the carpet. Pray, look at God's word, and be of one mind. The Spirit will make you of one mind if you trust Him. Look to see where the differences are in the major doctrines in the Bible. You know, the major stumbling blocks to unity are really pride and selfishness. Some have a passion to be always correct, but not necessarily correct according to God's Word. And our prideful attitudes can convince us that we're right so we can have our own way and control others. One sure way to achieve this is to already, um, I've already described it, <laughs> uh, but we're back to it. Look at this, Philippians 2 verses 3 to 5. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, humble. Let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not on, the, on, on, on every man his own things, but every man on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So if we start our interactions with the mind of humility, as the Bible tells us, we will be in the mind of Christ and we have to develop an attitude of viewing other believers as being better than ourselves. Then it's easy to express humility, which will usually be received in the same spirit that it was offered, which is a return of humility. True humility is laying aside our rights and interests and submitting to others. Now, that doesn't mean that we have to accept poor doctrine when you know what's correct. Ignorance of the scriptures or non-biblical positions on all kinds of issues just means we listen, we consider the position of others, and we respond in a humble, loving manner in order to have a mutual understanding of the Holy Spirit's truth. You know, it could be that we might divide over important doctrinal issues, but even in those cases, we should do it peaceably with humility. You know, Christ emptied himself of any attitude regarding his deity so that he could identify with humankind. 
The scriptures say he took the form of a bond servant and he gave up all his rights and submitted himself to the status of a slave. He washed the apostles' feet in complete submission to them and he was doing it to demonstrate humility and servanthood and they didn't understand it at first. It's almost impossible for us to consider his most humble action. God became a man. He left heaven. He entered a human body for the express purpose of giving up his life for us. And he did this in submission to the law of God that required a sacrifice for the sins of humanity for permanent atonement. You know, if we consider the crucifixion he suffered, man, it was reserved for the criminals, the worst of society that had committed the worst crimes that society had ever experienced. Mostly it was, it was used for the insurrectionists, the terrorists of the time that would uh, ruin the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. Christ did nothing to deserve this, but he willingly submitted himself to it. And that was a curse. The Bible affirmed that it was shameful and a curse for anyone who died in this manner. Uh, look at Galatians 3, 13, or the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 21, 23. Our Lord Jesus voluntarily submitted himself to this so we could have eternal salvation. He placed our interest above his so he could give us something we could never obtain on our own, and that's our salvation. He demonstrated the humble mind. So, as Philippians 2.5 says, to have the mind of Christ means to have the mind that is full of humility. The old King James Version calls it lowliness of mind. What an interesting picture, lowliness of mind. It's being humble, but it's power under control. We don't lose the focus of the truth or the facts of the scripture, and we don't use a forceful attitude when attempting to become like-minded with others in the Christian community. We must understand that we're totally dependent on God and not on our own self-worth and image. When we have the mind of Christ, we can't be self-exalted, self-willed, self-sufficient, arrogant, righteous, or glorious. Beloved, it's a blessing to be able to bring these concepts to you from God's Word. I look forward to seeing you in our next session. God bless you. We hope you have been blessed by this message today on a contemporarily relevant Bible topic. Dr. Woodhead has been teaching the Bible for 25 years. He is a pastor, an author, and conference speaker on various biblical subjects. Dr. Woodhead is the Dean of the Jewish Studies School at Schofield Seminary. His seminary teaching includes the Old Testament and Biblical Hebrew. He has attended Hebrew University in Jerusalem and a Hebrew College in Massachusetts. If you would like a DVD of today's program, please write us at Post Office Box 48, Hart, Michigan, 49420. Again, that's Post Office Box 48, Hart, Michigan, 49420. Or call us at 877 706 2479. That's 877 706 2479. Once again, 877 706 2479. The cost is $15. Let us know if you have any questions about today's broadcast. We look forward to providing you with continuing Bible messages each week on this station. God bless you.
take us there to the land of Zion. Next year in Jerusalem, the Shana Haba'a, the Yerushalayim. Next year in Jerusalem, O hear, O Israel, O Israel, hear. O Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Next year, the Shana Haba'a, the Yerushalayim. Next year in Jerusalem. Over there, over there, in the over there. 